Welcome to MPNUniversity.tv Clinical Insights. This discussion is about polycythemia vera and the treatment after patients have failed hydroxyurea and is moderated by Dr. Ruben Mesa. Our panel discussants are Dr. Serge Rostovsik, Dr. Richard Silver, and Emily Knight. We're now going to focus on polycythemia vera and the treatment after patients have failed hydroxyurea. Now first, Dick, in terms of failing hydroxyurea, what sort of toxicities might you see with a patient on hydroxyurea that would lead you to believe it's a therapy that should be discontinued? Well, I think the most important one is uh, the development of dermatologic toxicity. But we have to recognize that uh, patients with on hydroxyurea therapy have to be monitored for liver and renal toxicity as well, and of course, hematologic toxicity. But uh, speaking of, in a session in Arizona, this lovely state and city, uh, it is particularly important because of the high incidence of skin cancer, more in the south than in the north, uh, that uh, the potential dermatologic uh, oncogenic potential, the tendency for hydrea to cause skin cancer should be very well recognized. It's in the order of 20% of basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma. And the other significant problem is the development of skin ulcers over the ankle. And it's amazing how few dermatologists are aware of this, at least in my area in the Northeast. And so it's very often the hematologist that diagnoses the side effect of hydroxyurea, uh, rather than the dermatologist who the patient usually goes to. I don't know what's your experience, Emily. In terms of toxicity, Emily, what sort of things uh, do patients bring up with you? Sometimes they'll raise them to me, mm -hmm. but, but, but sometimes they may feel more comfortable sharing you know, toxicities with, uh, with the nursing part of the team. I would agree that um, skin ulcers can be very um, troublesome, bothersome, mouth sores as well. Mm -hmm. Some patients do suffer from, you know, uh, nausea, GI upset with, with the medication, um, but th the skin sores and mouth sores are probably the most troublesome for patients. Now, in addition to, in addition to toxicities from hydria, we can also have resistance or, or really a, a, a inadequate efficacy at a certain dose. Serge, how would you define resistance and give us a sense there's some formal uh, guidelines out there regarding failing hydria, well, what, what should people view those guidelines to be? I think the guideline is the word. It is a guideline and it uh, is something that has been derived by the experts in a field around the round table like this, where we all gathered together and, and projected our experience and said what would mean for us uh, a resistance. And, the primary resistance is the one that uh, you see at the beginning where there is no satisfactory response to your uh, implementation of hydroxyurea. And if the hydroxyurea at the two grams or more per day does not do a good job in controlling the symptoms, many in the academic centers, the experts in MPN, would suggest that that is uh, really a, a resistance to the drug because it's a lot that the patient needs to take. Of course, there are examples of patients taking more with a good control, but at such high levels, you would also encounter some <coughs> toxicities. So it, there is overlap between the two. And then there is a group of patients that lose response to a therapy over time, where you, let's say, start with one pill a day, 500 milligrams, and you do a good job for a very long time. And then the disease does change in some way that we don't really need uh, we don't really know how to explain, but the spleen starts to grow. You lose the response in the platelets or the red blood cells start to grow. You need more phlebotomies. You increase the dose. It does the job for some time, and then you need to increase again and again, and you don't have efficacy anymore. So a loss of response, and that would, again, by expert opinion, meaning that if you need to use two grams or more, that's not good enough for one to say it's working that would be then the cutoff for me to say, yes, really, it doesn't work. You still need phlebotomy at such a high dose. Let's change it to something else. Now, ruxolitinib was approved as a second-line therapy at the end of 2014 for individuals who really had an inadequate response to hydroxyurea. 
Serge, as one of really the, the lead investigator in the development of that agent, uh, what were the results that led to the FDA approval in, in the second line setting and in which patients should physicians really be thinking about that agent? It is important to realize that that study was specifically designed for patients that were judged by these guidelines that were implemented in the study now to be resistant, refractory, or intolerant to hydroxyurea. We know by the guidelines that there is also alternative first-line therapy, interferon. And in some countries in Europe in particular, in Denmark or France, it's uh, used in a large proportion of the patients, but not so in the United States which is a very interesting topic to discuss on its own. Most of the people in community setting in the United States do use hydroxyurea as a first line. So in this group of patients then that have not derived the benefit or lost the benefit or are intolerant and had requirement for phlebotomy and a big spleen at the same time, that is the population of patients, perhaps one or two in 10 in a community setting. That is the group of patients where ruxolitinib, a JAK inhibitor was tested prospectively in a randomized fashion versus best available therapy, including continuation of hydroxyurea, which did happen in about 60% of the patients. And it was better in controlling the hematocrit and reducing the spleen as a co-primary endpoint, and also as a secondary endpoint, improving the blood cell count in general, white cells and platelets. And we also know that it also improved the symptoms as well in these patients. So based on this study, it was specifically approved for patients intolerant or not doing well on hydroxyurea. That is a small niche, but I think it's valuable developing for the group of patients in general. Now, Dick, you have really been a leader throughout your career regarding the potential role of interferon in polycythemia variants specifically, as, as well as in other MPNs. If a patient has, in your practice, uh, been on interferon and failed interferon. What is your thought process now as you have options available to you of hydroxyurea that they haven't seen or ruxolitinib? Well, uh, to emphasize, we believe, uh, as you pointed out, that interferon is the, should be the initial treatment for patients with polycythemia vera. And we also think that for those patients who fail hydroxyurea, we, we find no difference in sensitivity to a patient who's never received it or who has. So we would always use interferon uh, as first and line therapy and also for those patients who have failed hydroxyurea. But in patients who have failed interferon, and we also ha should emphasize that about 15% of patients develop, even with low dose interferon, uh, side effects, which in, mostly in the older population is peripheral neuropathy and depression, or adding depression, that we, we try to uh, discontinue interferon uh, even when we use low-dose therapy because of the consequences of the, those uh, side effects. Now, Emily, you know, we have, for frontline, we have treated many with, with interferon as well, as well as having used it in second line, particularly before the uh, approval of ruxolitinib. However, it doesn't always go as well as we would like. What are some of the toxicities our patients with interferon sometimes have seen that have really made us scramble for an alternative option? Well, initially up front, the patients um, generally just complain of the flu-like symptoms, um, you know, maybe some low-grade fevers, body aches. But as they're on the medication longer, we have seen patients that have had some inflammatory type reactions and inflammatory pneumonia, a case of lupus with the patient. So um, in those instances, we've had to get together and try to find an alternative. Now, I've found along the way that there's a lot of ways our patients with P. vera cannot be doing well, including sometimes having a very significant symptom burden, even on being hydroxyurea or interferon. Serge, in your mind, as you look at the, the broader scope of, of poorly controlled P. vera, it, it give us a sense, and, and you have such a, a large referral practice, of the spectrum of complaints people are coming in where they're really not well controlled with their P. vera. You see, the therapies that we have, hydroxyurea, interferon, maybe other uh, alternatives like alkylating agents, which I would not usually use on my own, may control the blood cell count well and decrease the risk of thrombosis 
at the expense of some toxicity that you mentioned and that we discussed, including glucomogenic potential. But the spectrum of the symptoms that these patients come with has not been very well described until recent work of uh, your work, uh, Ruben, saying that there is a large proportion of the patients that may have a good control of the counts, but the quality of life is rather poor in terms of the circulatory problems with the headaches, blood vision, peripheral neuropathy, not because of therapy, but because of the disease, tingling in fingers and toes, fatigue, weakness, low-grade fevers. There are other, therefore, uh, needs beyond the control of the thrombotic risk and the control of the blood cell count that we have not emphasized in our care so far much. In fact, we were able, and we are still, providing therapies that may contribute to symptoms at the expense of uh, controlling the blood cell count. That's not the goal. In my mind, the goal for all types of myeloproliferative neoplasm patients is to control the disease signs, but also symptoms. Sure. I think, Ruben, if I may also point out, is that uh, the major problem with respect to the symptoms that patients who have been treated have, uh, that I see, relates to anemia. And that's to the over, uh, not over vigorous, because as we've discussed in the past, that we must try to keep the hematocrit uh, under a set level of 45, plus or minus, as we have discussed. And in so doing, many of those patients are iron deficient. And I think it's only recently that the consequences of iron deficiency anemia have really been stressed as affecting all kinds of enzyme systems, leading to early dementia, frequent falls, uh, uh, fatigue, weakness, et cetera. So I think we really have to look at the iron stores in these patients. Now the problem is you can't give these patients iron, so we have to do something to suppress the frequency of phlebotomy. Well, I think you're definitely correct that, you know, as it, it we look at the, the data regarding the symptom burden, one fatigue is, is a major one. And I do think the iron deficiency, even iron deficiency without anemia, mm. I mean, there's clearly quite a buffer of iron deficiency one can experience before having, becoming all the way anemic. But that is a, a major negative. You know, we see many other aspects that go along with that. There's a lot of challenges in terms of intimacy, frank impotency, or, or other issues regarding yeah, sexuality that patients can experience. A lot of issues with insomnia. In so many of these patients is, I think, much more prevalent than we recognize, and that may be exacerbation of restless leg with the iron deficiency and other pieces. So a lot of ways that they can really have uh, you know, significant difficulties from that symptomatic burden. Now, ruxolitinib surge, you led the development in myelofibrosis. How should physicians be thinking about uh, ruxolitinib in Pivera as opposed to myelofibrosis, whether it be around dosing or, or monitoring? Once we determine that the current therapy for patients is not satisfactory anymore, and a patient is intolerant, resistant, or a losing response, then implementation of ruxolitinib is uniformly the same, 10 milligrams twice a day. Unlike myelofibrosis, where we judge the starting dose based on plated number, here, we uh, start everybody at the 10 milligrams twice a day. This is de a device from uh, initial pilot phase two study where we actually did test different starting dose. And it appears that the starting low, and 10 milligrams would be relatively low because 25 milligrams twice a day is the maximum, is reasonable here not to cause too much of myelosuppression. In the response study, this is the phase three randomized study versus best available therapy that led to its approval, we did see that about half of the patients, almost 60% of the patients, did require increasing the dose during the first three months from 10 milligrams to 15 milligrams or even to 20 milligrams twice a day to achieve the control of the signs and symptoms, the blood cell count and the symptoms. So um, it is prudent to start low in that situation because it is a rather benign condition. We are not talking about extraordinary big spleens or extraordinary need for uh, control of the disease as we are talking in myelofibrosis phase. So 10 milligrams twice a day, looking at the patients perhaps every two weeks, for first three months at least, three to four months, adjusting the dose, avoiding interruption, because you lose all the benefit within 10 days, 
particularly in symptoms. So proactive adjustments, and in fact, most of the time it will be for higher doses to achieve the goals rather than lower doses. But if you need to lower it, lower it proactively, not to interrupt. And then by three or four months, most of the people will get to uh, the dose that is good for them. And then you follow patients perhaps for a few months monthly and then every three to six months. And what would you consider to be the ceiling? I agree with you. There are some patients, particularly around really refractory pruritus or other things I've needed to go up from 10 twice a day. But what's the ceiling for the dosing of ruxolindab? <clears throat> now, traditionally, the maximum tolerated dose was uh, 25 milligrams twice a day. And that is allowed to go to, but many times that is too high a dose, even in malofibrosis, where we need to shrink the spleen much and the dose-dependent uh, spleen reduction is in place. The higher the dose, the better the spleen reduction. Here, there is no such a need. So 10 milligrams twice a day starting dose, going up based on safety first, meaning not need to incur, incur any anemia or thrombocytopenia, adjusting the dose based on the numbers. And the symptoms will get better. Uh, experience from malofibrosis is that the 10 milligrams twice a day or higher is equally effective for symptom control. Excellent. Hey, Emily, perhaps a concluding word is we're tracking patients with laboratory studies or monitoring for symptoms with ruxolinib in P. vera. How is that similar or different than myelofibrosis? I think it's uh, similar in, to myelofibrosis in that they do experience some of the same symptoms. They have the, the night sweats, the itching, the, the big spleen though maybe their symptoms aren't as severe. Um, so when they're on the ruxolitinib, we, we tend to see an improvement in their symptoms. And what frequency should we be monitoring their blood counts as we're determining the, the dose adjustments that Serge was discussing? Yeah, so initially, usually every week to two weeks, um, and then once they're on the stable dose and their symptoms are controlled and their counts are controlled, we would you know back it off to uh, every month, to every three months. Well, great. Well, thank you. Well, this, thank you all. This has been a very good discussion regarding second-line therapies in polycythemia vera and really defining the patient that has failed hydroxyurea. Thank you. Thank you.